later. Next talk is by David Kriebel, um, who is a, a colleague and professor in the Department of Public Health at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and he's the director of the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production. Um, his research focuses on epidemiology of occupational injuries, uh, cancer, and non-malignant respiratory disease. And he is reporting on a study that um, is not quite published yet, but we hope will be. So you are getting hot off the press here from David. Thank you very much. Great to be with you today. January 29th, 2019. What was supposed to happen today and is not happening? State of the Union. State of the Union. And uh, don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do my imitation. I'm terrible at imitations. But, but uh, we'll give you a little, a little piece of perhaps what we might wish was a, a State of the Union discussion. Uh, State of the Union on cancer. How are we doing? Uh, Dr. White began with a very nice, uh, very good uh, overview of some of the really important trends, the complexity, and ending with a really encouraging message about the opportunities for laptop epidemiologists to get into the data. Uh, all of that, a really good way to start this uh, State of the Union. Um, so I'll continue um, taking a slightly longer uh, a view. Uh, these are the data that uh, Dr. White referred to, the SEER data. Uh, not comprehensive for the whole U.S., but a good uh, representative sample. They, these are the highest quality data that go back for the longest period of time. So you get to see this picture all the way back to the 1970s. So how are we doing in this war on cancer? What's that look like to you? Right? Not, not, not so good, I, I would say. Overall cancer rates are just about where they were 40 years ago. 40 years ago. And if you look, of course, at the uh, period since the, uh, the 90s, you'll see uh, where Dr. White's data began, because those are where the comprehensive national data are. And indeed, you do see, right, there is some downward trend there, quite, quite good to see, uh, opportunity. Um, but, but the longer term view is actually we're nowhere better off than we were 40 years ago. That decline since the 1990s is uh, mostly probably due to this decline. This is, these are data on smoking prevalence in uh, the United States in the counties covered by those data, the SEER counties. There's about six, there's 600 of them. So this is a good sample of the US. So, so you see that trend, and remember that nice, gentle downward slope. This is an encouraging thing. People are smoking less, and the, smoke, and the cancer uh, rates, uh, to some of the cancer rates are coming down. <laughs> because of that. And, and you know, here again, um, this uh, is, is very, very important. Here's a paper by some of the leading uh, cancer uh, prevention researchers in the country uh, saying the most striking success in cancer primary prevention is undoubtedly tobacco, where falling consumption has resulted in marked reductions in the incidence and death rates from tobacco-related causes among men. And, and Dr. White pointed out, not so much among women, actually. So, it's understandable to a degree, of course, that we uh, encourage people to uh, have healthy, healthy lifestyles, to stop smoking, to have a good diet and exercise. They do prevent cancer. Um, but how do we find the right balance in the messaging? That's what I want to talk about in the next few minutes. Um, and here is, if you just go to the American Cancer Society website, uh, this is what you find when you go to cancer prevention, right? The, the, the screen, the top page when it opens has four directives for you, all of them really important messages, right? Stay away from tobacco, be safe in the sun, eat healthy, protect yourself against human papillomavirus. Very, very important. Then it, you have to scroll down and it says more topics. And down there it says learn about carcinogens. Now, I'm a professor. I am really in favor of learning. But learning does not prevent cancer. Um, so isn't it interesting, the change in the directive here? So there are other causes of cancer besides lifestyles. Dr. Shetler has just done a very nice overview of, the, uh, admittedly, the complexity of these causal webs. But shouldn't uh, the elimination of carcinogens also be a prevention strategy. 
Uh, yes, we think so, but there's a debate, isn't there, about the proper emphasis to give to the environmental carcinogens. Um, here's, a, here's an example of, of the tension around this. It's from a few years ago now, but a, a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of our leading medical journals, again, by leading cancer prevention researchers. Um, they say, it's important not to detract from the fact that the major causes of cancer are smoking, overweight, and inactivity. So, so warning us not to get confused about those being the primary message. Well, what is the right balance in cancer prevention? How important are changing lifestyle behaviors, uh, controlling pollution, other prevention strategies? And so I'm an epidemiologist. My colleagues are epidemiologists. And um, we uh, thought of a way that perhaps we could help uh, you all, uh, us all, think about the answers to that balancing question. Uh, Dr. Shetler talked about ide oh, ideologic fractions and attributable fractions. These are complicated statistics. Um, they uh, can be misleading. So we tried to think of a different way to, uh, to crunch the numbers, to look at the data, to see if this would help. So you, you, can, you can tell me. You can decide if you think this is helpful. What we did is uh, we conducted a what-if experiment, which we can do with our statistical models. What if smoking was completely eliminated? Wave the magic wand, it's gone. Because that's the goal of the primary prevention strategy, right, that leads all the lists. So OK, let's make it happen. It's going to be hard, right? So in reality, probably not going to happen. But, but even if it could, what would the impact be? Let's follow the logical, that to its logical conclusion. How much would re cancer rates fall? And to make the best case here, what we did is we just focused on the 13 kinds of cancer that smoking causes. It causes a lot of different kinds of cancer, but not all of them. So we said, let's make the best case. Let's calculate what fraction of these smoking-related cancers, lung, larynx, bladder, kidney, it's a long list, what fraction of them would go away if we eliminated smoking? Some technical details, happy to talk about them. We're, we're, we're cancer data nerds, but I'll skip uh, the details for you uh, uh, for this audience. But um, basically what we did is we constructed a big statistical model analyzing the variability in county by county cancer rates. We're looking at the county level for these 13 types of cancer. We're looking at these uh, SEER data, as they're called, the subset that are the highest quality data that go back the longest period of time for a, a sample of US counties for that period, uh, basically the 21st century so far, 2001 to 2015. We have data on county level estimates of what the proportion of the population smokes. We assumed a lag, because as you know, it takes a while. If you start smoking today, you won't get cancer tomorrow, right? So there's a delay, so we, we investigated that. And we took account of important factors like age and gender. We uh, considered all races combined. These are, the, these are the 13 kinds of cancer that are included. It's quite a long list. So uh, here we go. The, the, first of all, this is not the model. These are the actual data. This is just the trend in cancer incidence at these 13 sites uh, from 2001 to 2015. And as you can see, the trend is going down. That's good, and, and we're happy to see that. And it's largely due to that reduction in, in smoking that I showed you earlier. So now, what we can do with our model, though, is we can say, let's suppose that smoking had been removed entirely, eliminated. What would the trend in cancer look like? So just think about it for a moment before I show it to you, right? So here it is. So what's going to happen if we wave a magic wand, go to a different world, something, right, where there's no smoking? The rates go down, of course, because smoking causes cancer. Do the, can do the rates go away? Not at all, of course. Even these smoking-related cancers, there are many of them that would still be occurring. More than half, actually. And the other thing that you can see is that not only are the smoking-related cancers still happening, but 
the trend is not downwards anymore, it's flat. In other words, we're making no progress on preventing cancer at these sites except for the little bit of reduction from smoking. I shouldn't say a little bit, right? It's a substantial reduction from smoking. It goes from the green line to the red line. So I don't want to minimize that, but I also want to make it clear, right? This is not the whole story. It's not enough. So the bottom line is even for the types of cancer that are linked to smoking, we have a lot more work to do, right? Tobacco control is not enough. One other way that we, one other thing we can do with this model, this what if uh, simulation, is um, we can look at the county level because some counties are going to have higher or lower smoking uh, cancer rates after this, you know, hypothetical removal of smoking. Some can some counties are going to do better, and others are going to do worse um, after assuming the complete elimination of smoking. And this might be a way, a useful way perhaps, to identify places where other causes, environmental, nutrition, disparities, uh, may be more important or less important. So we did this for Allegheny County here. Allegheny County, as I think probably most of you know, uh, does have uh, higher rates of a, a number of different kinds of cancer. Some of them the smoking-related cancers, like lung cancer and bladder cancer. Allegheny County's smoking prevalence is higher than the national average. Ah, so is that why Allegheny County has higher cancer rates? Well, as you can see, it's not much higher. So you might already be a little suspicious about that, right? And indeed, uh, according to our model, when we wave our wand, we remove from Allegheny County all of the cancers caused by smoking here, even that slightly higher prevalence of smoking, Allegheny County remains in the highest 10% of all of the 612 Sear counties. Right. So smoking is not enough in Allegheny County to bring it down to average even, let alone uh, really make, make progress beyond that. So I'm almost done, but I, I thought I'd throw in one more piece of evidence here because you know, you, you would be, I wouldn't blame you at all for being suspicious about a fancy statistical model that you don't completely understand. So, so I'm going to give you another way to see this, which has got nothing up my sleeves. There's no models, just data. A, a few years ago, a doctoral student uh, working with me, Jessica Burkhammer, uh, looked at cancer trends in teenagers, again in the SEER data. These are 15 to 19 year olds. It's a small slice, but that's the way the age groups break out. 15 to 19 year olds, uh, all the way back to 1975. Fortunately, as you know, cancer, thankfully, is rare in teenagers, but of course it does occur. And so even when you look at the national data, it's a bit bumpy, right? Just noisy, because they're not a lot. But what, 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 what's the picture? What's the picture? The rates are going up, undeniably. Why are cancer rates going up for the last 38 years in teenagers? 27% increase since 1975. One way to see that statistic in the US today, it's about 5,000 teens get cancer every year. If we could just dial back the rates to when I was a teenager, a thousand less kids would be getting cancer every year. There's a thousand teens who are getting cancer because the rates are higher than they were when I was a teenager. Why are the rates higher? We don't know all the answers to that. We should. We should study that. But we don't know. But is it due to smoking? Is it due to obesity? No, it's not. Because they're too young. It's not to say, right, that smoking in teens is not a problem, that they shouldn't smoke. It's not to say that obesity is not a problem, but it hasn't had long enough to affect them. It's not their lifestyles, right? These teens are not getting cancer because of their bad lifestyles. So what should we do? Well, we need to research it to figure out why. But the other thing we need to do, I think, right, is start with what we know. Start with the known risk factors. Are, are, are kids, are teens getting exposed to carcinogens that we know about right now? 
Absolutely, they are. So maybe we should start there. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Overall, national cancer incidence is essentially unchanged since the 1970s. In kids, it's actually getting worse. Oh, or younger kids also, but I focused on the teens here. Uh, given this, it seems to me that we need to eliminate carcinogens wherever we find them, that we should not get stuck in debates about how much is the highest priority. Healthy lifestyle is absolutely important, but it's not sufficient. Some easy targets of high priorities would have to be things like air pollution, particularly diesel, which is turning out to be a tremendously potent carcinogen. We didn't know that even 20 years ago. Now we know. Uh, in industrial sources, uh, in, indoor air, uh, a tremendous problem of building materials that are off-gassing, consumer products. Uh, Dr. Shetler talked about a few of those. So I'd like to thank my collaborators. They're all uh, here in the room today. Doug Myers is in the back from West Virginia University, and Polly Hoppin and Molly Jacobs, you've already uh, met, and Dick Clapp, you'll hear from uh, soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. That one, too, complex um, ideas to convey, so welcome your feedback um, on that.